Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's amazing program with Sheer, with Coach Menachem Bernfeld and Rabbi uh, Shay Tal here tonight on Super Bowl Sunday night. Tonight is Sheer 175. Thank you for joining us. And uh, again, thank you for all the people that promote us, let people know about it. They forward the emails. I will post on the WhatsApp status. I really appreciate it. Again, it's a Slaverim. Tonight's a very important Sheer. And we're going to we're going to cover a lot of important topics, especially this topic. And if anybody wants to join the chats, you could definitely uh, join. You could uh, WhatsApp 732-314-1710. And then we'll send you a link to the community chats. We'll also post the community chats in the flyers and on the thing tonight. And at Shem, every week you'll get an email. You get to know who's speaking. You get the replays. So please join us every week. It's been, uh, it's been a wild ride, and it keeps on getting better. And uh, also, we're going to post uh, the, the community chats for Coach Menachem. And also, anybody wants to join Rabbi Shays' tab, uh, WhatsApp statuses, we're going to send the link, and also in the email, and also his website, soulwords.org, and also soulwords, you can look on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. He has, you know, he only comes on once in a while by uh, Coach Menachem, but uh, if people need a big, more dose of uh, Rabbi Taub, he's available all the time, and he definitely covers a lot of important topics, so... We'll send out all that information as well. All the people that are watching the replay of this on YouTube, click on the subscribe button to Coach Menachem's uh, uh, channel, and also click on the like button. And thank you to all the advertising sponsors of Lakewood Scoop here on Lakewood, Ellie Nario from Five Towns Central, Kyla Kaufman from JCN, and Mrs. Mika Sofa from uh, COL Live for posting tonight's share and promoting it. We really appreciate it. And again, if anybody's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 on the Zoom ID, we have different Rabbanim, different topics different important discussions to have next, next week. We're going to have February 18th, live from Eretz Yisrael, a discussion of Hanania Greenwald, the Rosh Hashiva, from TJ in Eretz Yisrael. He's been a Kinnik, I don't know how many years. I, I forgot to ask him, but I think it's a long time. He has thousands of Talmidim, and um, actually one of my son was learned by him for a little bit. And uh, the title is, Is it possible to achieve proper parenting alongside unconditional love and freedom? Navigating parenthood, achieving harmony between guidance and freedom for adult teenagers. So it'll be a very powerful program. Somebody who's dealt, you know, kind of for many, many years, and he has his own take on everything. So please join us, and Shem uh, should be a powerful share. Hold on one second. Um, tonight's share with the course in the honor of having world famous rabbi speaker, who's basically a regular in Coach Menachem. He sits on our board over here, the board of directors, Rabbi Taub, coming back again. And just to make it clear, you know, he came on a while ago. Um, discussing uh, masculinity and issues that men deal with in modern times, understanding the pressures, struggles, and importance of a men's role in from community. We got tremendous feedback in that chair. And a lot of the feedback was people asking for a woman's version, what women have to deal with. And we got a spoke about right after the chair that we're going to do a version of that for the woman. And uh, we're here tonight to uh, really follow up on our promise and to do what women have to deal with in today's generation. You know, it's, every, it's definitely a lot of things have changed over the last... 50 years, but, you know, probably even more than that. And we're really going to get into what women deal with in today's day and age. So please uh, buckle up. It's going to be a, a wild ride. And uh, tonight's year is year 175. We're first going to start off with a gematria. Our and give the gematria of 175. Let's put them on and let's see if it's a good gematria. Let's go. Zoom share number 175. What is the woman? A spiritual view of femininity and the challenges of Jewish women today. The Gemara says, Matzah Isha, Matzah Taif, which leads us up to the nice Gematria 175, the nature of someone who's good is to do good to, to others. Okay, we'll see if that plays into the Shir tonight. We'll see. At the end, we'll vote on the Gematria. And we're going to start off first with Coach Menachem. Everybody here tonight really had a lot of other things to do. It's a very busy night, Sunday night. Super Bowl and Zachem, but they came here to Rabbi Sheikh's tab. Why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? Coach Menachem, lay, lay it on us. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone, to another Let's Get Real. Baruch Hashem, a lot of siyat and I want to welcome Rabbi, Rabbi Sheikh for being with us tonight. Doing tonight, Baruch Hashem, 175. And like we heard, it's a follow-up. The We discussed in the past, it was number 140, for those who want to listen to it. To understand that even men are human, and we discussed that men need a place to be able to be vulnerable, a place to share, to feel accepted, and you know, many people out there and from the outside they look like they have it all. 
it looks amazing, but inside, really, there's a lot of loneliness. And we opened up a, a lot of ideas, and a lot of things came out of it, Baruch Hashem. And here we are, following up, and we're going to discuss those their wives, to see what they need, and um, what feelings that come up, what could be filled up from their husbands and what not. It's, it's a lot of people are confused when they saw the topic. What is a woman? They were like, why are we talking about this? Or why are you talking about this? What kind of question is this? And uh, all of those questions that came up. Ultimately, what we're looking for is everybody wants to do their tachlis on this world. We're here for a reason. And Hashem created us the way we are. And everybody has a role, a tachlis. If we know what the tachlis is and we feel we're accomplishing, we're towards the, that tachlis, we feel fulfilled. We feel we're doing the right thing. Now, a lot of people might not be happy where they are and be upset or maybe pointing some fingers, trying to change, trying to be in a different place. The example is like a puzzle. If one piece who doesn't want to be where it belongs, it wants to be somewhere else, it just doesn't fit. We're all here together with the, in that puzzle, and we all have our own mission. Many people go into marriage thinking that when after they get married, their spouse is going to fill them up, is going to fill them, fill up that part that they're looking for. You know, afterwards they'll, they'll have flameless, which is supposed to be that way. But many times after. A while they still they're still walking around with that that piece that they're missing, whether it's loneliness or different things that they feel, and they start pointing fingers. If only my spouse would, if only they would do this, if only that, then I would be good. Everything would work out. But not realizing that it sometimes it's it's something that others cannot fulfill, and it's something that we have to work on. But that's really a question, and uh, we'll probably talk about it tonight. When is it legitimate? Uh, it, it's a good complaint to say, you know, they're not doing what they have to do, and uh, they're not part of it. Or they're doing what they have to do. Your spouse is doing great. It's something that you feel and you need to work out, whether it's with a therapist or a rabbi or somebody, to discuss what's that piece that you're, you feel you're missing. So, in Mitzvah Shem, we have a lot of Siyat and Shemaya tonight. And thank you again, Rabbi Shez, for being here. And uh, we should be able to help all of those that need it. And we should be able to talk and fulfill our Tachlis in Mitzvah Shem. Coach Menachem, beautiful opening. Again, let's, overview, let's, let's have the overview of tonight's share. What is a woman? A spiritual view of femininity and the challenges of a Jewish woman today. I'm going to read Rabbi Shea's bio very quickly. Rabbi Shea is a renowned teacher, speaker, and author of topics of Jewish spirituality. His application to our daily lives. He's director of the Torah website, soulwords.org, and a scholar resident of the Chabad of Five Towns. And um, I'm going to, before Rabbi Tav speaks, like, we got a lot of emails tonight, but this was the best email. I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to go into it. <laughs> so we'll start with this email. Um, somebody wrote, can I make just one comment? Don't you feel it's both ironic and sad to have a discussion about what is a woman given by a moderated by, by entirely by men? So I thought that was a great question. <laughs> and we'll start with that, Rabbi Taub. Yes, Aboshi, yeah. Um, did I not make the same comment to you when we were uh, planning this year? You made the top, you made the comment, but when it came in the email, it was much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you believed it. Um, I said, you know, I feel kind of funny, you know, how am I an expert in uh, femininity when I've never had any practice? So, or at least I can't speak from any personal experience. So Coach Menachem mentioned, but I want to just reiterate so everybody understands why we're doing this. We had a show, how long ago was it? It was at least six months ago when I was on last time. We know uh, it was at least six months ago. Um, where we focused on men's roles. And I felt like that was a very important topic, an under-recognized need to sort of empower men and to acknowledge some of the issues that men have, and specifically some of the, the loneliness that men feel. And I do want to mention, by the way, that after that year, several men contacted me and told me that they and other men 
had made a point to come together to support each other. And uh, if that's all that came from this year, then I already feel like it, it accomplished something. But we had a lot of feedback, um, like, okay, you told one half of the story, but what's with the other half of the story? What's with, you know, can you address the women's side of things? So that's what we're here for. And yeah, I I don't know the woman's side of things firsthand. I can't pretend to know for a moment what it's actually like to be in that position. But I'll, I'll tell you like this. When I came on and I spoke about men's roles, however long ago it was, last time I was on, um, where did I get my perspective from when I was speaking about what, what it means to be a man? I mean, yeah, obviously it was colored by my own personal experience as as a man, but mostly I was trying to at least convey what Toyota has to say about the subject. And that's what I'm going to try to do with Hashem's help tonight is I'm going to try to speak to you from Toyota's perspective because at the end of the day, the, be the beginning of the day, the end of the day, the middle of the day, this is the truth. Toyota's perspective is the truth. And there is a lot of confusion in the world today. There is a specifically, there, there's a lot of confusion in general, but specifically about gender roles and the relationships between men and women. And in a time when there's confusion, then we need to calibrate, we need to recalibrate and we need to get back our clarity. And ain't Amos el The only truth is really Hashem's holy Toyota. So that's where I'm going to try to come from. So yes, I have no personal experience as a woman, but I'm speaking from the perspective of Toyota as well as I understand it. And Toyota understands men and women because Toyota is Hashem's Toyota. And Hashem is the one who made, made men and Hashem made women and understands how they work. Okay. Um, we have a lot of really good questions tonight. And I don't want to like prolong that too much. I would love to get into the questions. So I'm going to give a little preface, but I don't think it's going to be more than five minutes here. Um, a five minute introduction, but what I need everyone to do is, um, go deep with me because it's going to save us time in the long run. We're going to talk about some very lofty spiritual terms, but once we have a vocabulary to speak about this topic from a truly spiritual perspective, it's going to make a lot of other things all of a sudden clear. So let's let's talk about the spiritual perspective. Men and women down here in the physical world are uh, biological designations. You have a man, you have a woman. That's uh, simple and clear to everybody, at least it was until not too long ago. But the physical concept, the biological concept of a man and a woman is really a reflection of a higher spiritual concept. And what is the spiritual concept of male and female? It is the concept of mashpia and mekabal. Mashpia and mekabal is often translated as the provider and the recipient. But it's a little bit misleading to call a macabre a recipient. And I'll tell you why. Because when you describe someone as a recipient, it makes them sound very passive. It makes them sound like they really have no contribution. They're just there to receive whatever it is that the provider provides. But the way that Toyota explains mashpia and macabre is that the recipient actually has a very important contribution and a very important role, and in some ways a role that's even more important than the initial provider. I'll give you an example that's not gender-specific, but it's mashpia and makabal in a different context. Teacher and student. So a teacher provides, right? The teacher is the one who brought the lesson. Everyone's waiting for the teacher to speak. And... Students just there to listen, right? However, after the student receives the teachings from the teacher, in the end, if the student is a good student, 
the student will trigger something in the teacher that the teacher was incapable of access, accessing on his own without the student, which is the idea of mitalmidai yesa that the teacher receives the most from his students. So who's the giver and who's the recipient there? It seems that the student who started as the recipient becomes the ultimate giver. Give you another example. You know, uh, we say that more than the balabos does for the ani, the ani does for the balabos, giver and recipient in terms of tzedakah. So obviously, uh, from one perspective, the one who's giving tzedakah is the giver. But in the end, the recipient is actually an even bigger giver because what is the recipient of the tzedakah giving to the giver of the tzedakah? A source of a mitzvah, which is incomparably more precious than whatever it is, the value of the, of the tzedakah that was given. I'll give you another example. The six work days and Shabbos. Six work days are considered masculine. Shabbos is considered feminine. That's why it's the queen. From a very superficial uh, 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 perspective, it looks like Shabbos is very receptive, very passive. You can't do any work on Shabbos. That's why we say one who toils on Erev Shabbos will eat on Shabbos. If all of a sudden you have Friday night that you didn't make a kugel, it's too late. There's nothing you can do. Shabbos, you can't do anything. You can't make anything. Shabbos only has whatever the six days prepared for her and gave to her. So it looks like she's very passive, very weak. She's got nothing, no contribution. And yet, if you look at it more deeply, you realize, hold on a second, the six days you can go out and work and make some money and go shopping and buy ingredients and come home and cook and make stuff, and you'll have a kugel if you if you do everything right for six days. And you give that kugel, I'm just picking out kugel as an example, to Shabbos. But then what does Shabbos do when she receives that kugel? She turns it into much more than a piece of food. She turns that into your Shabbos meal, which brings you the blessings that gives you the energy and the strength to go out and do it again for another six days. So she went from being recipient to giver. And that's male and female. Now, I can illustrate it in the most simple way using the biological example, which nobody can dispute, which is where babies come from. The male has to initiate but I'm saying that the male provides the biological material, the DNA, but the woman's the one where gestation takes place. She develops it, and she turns it from this microscopic cell into, into your baby with 248 limbs and 365 sinews and a smile and a personality and a, and a name. So she's a recipient at first, but then she ends up becoming an even bigger giver. Okay. So that's the deep explanation. Now let's talk about it in very practical terms. In very practical terms, when you have a man and a woman in a relationship called a marriage, both will only be satisfied and fulfilled if each is functioning according to their role. And that means that when it comes to their interaction, men need to be the initiators. That means, I'll put it in very simple terms, when a man comes home from work, and I mentioned this six months ago or whenever it was I was on last time, and I said to the men, when a man comes home from work, as much as you might feel beaten down from the world out there, you have to come home as a provider. You have to come home and bring the emotional energy to your wife, show her that you care, give her energy, give her focus, give her attention, be a giver. And then what does she do? She takes that energy that he infuses within her. She gets filled up and she almost like you could compare it to pregnancy. Really? She takes that little bit of energy that he puts into her just by sitting and having a cup of tea with her for a half an hour or even, you know, shorter time. I mean, it doesn't have to be a huge investment, but he focuses on her, gives to her for a while. She gets filled up. She becomes pregnant with that energy. And then she can fill the entire house with varmkeit and lichtekeit. And you have a house where your children are happy and everybody's happy. And it's a, it's a good place to be. But it started from the man's initiating. But the woman is the one who upgrades it and 
amplifies it incomparably to make it what we know as a, as a functional household. So this is where a lot of the problems come in. And we're going to talk about this because I want to get to the real life questions. One issue, because a woman can turn what her husband gives what a woman can turn what her husband gives to her into something a million times greater than when he gave her but she's got to have something to work with what does a woman do when she's getting nothing he's not even giving her anything to work with she can turn a dollar into a million dollars but he's got to give her a dollar to work with that's one issue i'm not here to give solutions just yet i'm here to describe some of the problems Okay, another issue. Because women are recipients, we don't talk about this very often, but there's a certain vulnerability in being a recipient. In other words, when you are the one who's taking something into you, you've got to have very good boundaries in order to not be invaded. So that's another issue about boundaries. And then there, there's another whole discussion which is about how do women have fulfillment in ways where they're not necessarily recipients from their husbands or from anyone else? Is there a place for a woman to have a more masculine role and to be the initiator in any aspect of her life? Is that important? Is that acceptable? Can it be done without affecting the marriage adversely? And uh, those are just some of the questions. I'm not here. I don't want to answer anything. I just want to put it out there as a framework. And now I think I, I'm ready to go into the real life questions. Okay. Every time you, just, you laid it out there and now we're going to get into it. Okay, let's start off with the polls and then we'll take live questions. Again, if anybody wants to ask a live question, please ask live. I want to mention tonight, it's my wife's birthday, February 11th. So I want to give the dollar now. I gave it the shout out, and now I'm waiting for the million dollars in return. Okay, launch it. A billion. A, a billion. billion. <clears throat> okay, very simple questions here. Everybody can vote even if you're a man, but we just want to get understanding. What do you believe is the most under-recognized under source of stress for a firm woman today? Four choices. Marriage, dealing with a husband. Two, kids. I don't know why this is keeping happening every week. It doubles the question, Menachem, every single week. Yeah. Two kids or three finances. The other one was supposed to be really um, just social uh, issues, but I don't know. For some reason it doesn't come out. So we're just going to deal with marriage. I see it. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't come up on, on the screen, though. It doesn't come up on the screen. I see it on my screen. Yeah, not on ours. Number two, what do from women most wish their husband could learn better from their chasen teacher? That's a great question. First question, first answer is how to listen. Second is how to show affection. Third option is how to how to help in the house. Fourth option, how to be a better example of the importance of davening and learning. Third question, what is the most important thing for a Jewish girl, for, a thing for a Jewish girl to learn from their mother? What do you think will be the most important thing? Number one, help develop a relationship with Hashem. Okay. How to develop a relationship with Hashem. Number two, the value of tzniyas, modesty. Number three, how to support their husbands. Or number four, how to multitask and manage domestic, domestic responsibilities. Three very good questions. And everybody, please vote. And then we will uh, get to the results. I'll do it. like that. Chase, I think I just got my dollar given back to me. What happened? <laughs> oh, my dollar just came back. Just as one dollar, it wasn't upgraded yet? No, I gave him the dollar. I was expecting the billion, but I, I just got the dollar back. Just the one dollar. Okay. The whole shares for my wife. She's the most amazing wife. She yes. Is. I'm so thrilled to be married to my wife on her birthday. She's an amazing Asia Kyle. Yes. And she's, the whole share is in her honor. Can I get the billion now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's end the polls, and then let's see what everybody voted. Share the polls. Here we go. Here's the answers, everybody. Okay. You said, what do you believe is the most under-recognized source of stress for, for women today? 45% of people believe marriage. 
48% of people, kids, and 20% finances. I don't know how those numbers work out. But basically, most people believe marriage and kids is like split and 20% finances. Okay. The third, the second question, what do from women most wish their husband teacher, their husband would learn better from the husband teacher? 42% how to listen, 44% how to show affection. So pretty split over there. Only 10% how to, to help in the house. Mm -hmm. And only 2% how to be a better example of the importance of davening and learning. Number three, what is the most important thing for a Jewish girl to learn from their mother? 43% believe how to develop a, Shem, a relationship with Hashem. 9% the value of Tznias. 33% how to support their husbands. And 15% how to multitask and manage domestic responsibilities. Wow. Wow. Very interesting, actually. Yeah. So I guess the yeah. husband should first go back to the second question. Let's go back to the first question. Um, it seems like marriage and kids is like a very uh, difficult thing in today's 2024 for a woman to deal with. Let's get into that a little bit. A lot of pressure, yeah, regarding the parenting. And the woman is the one on the front lines who's dealing with it day in and day out. And, you know, ask the men how many of them know the names of all their kids' teachers this year. Names of the kids or the teachers? Named, <laughs> names of their kids' teachers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I hope they know the names of the kids. Although, you know what? I always feel guilty about when I go to the um, pharmacy to pick up a prescription, and they, they ask me, it. they ask me the English birthday, and I always tell, I don't, I don't know, I, I know they the Hebrew birthday. Call my wife. <laughs> I, I actually have it written on my phone. I pull it up so I don't have to call her anymore. <laughs> yeah, and also I, when it comes to the the Chassan teacher question. It seems like they like the the actual communication, the listening and the affection, is where they feel there's a lack. They feel like helping the house and stop learning and davening. It must be the chas teacher doing a good job. Or or, or or another interpretation is maybe there's a lack, but it's not as important to fill that lack. In other words, when you're prioritizing, which there may be things that all need improvement, but where are you prioritizing? And which one do you want to improve? The most so yeah it was a bit basically a tie between uh listening and showing affection more or less and the third question also very interesting like the developing a relationship with hashem and supporting their husbands was like the main they didn't feel sneeze was something that the mother's big thing to learn from the mother and multitasking and domestic responsibility they didn't feel it was like such a strong thing from the mother to learn i was surprised but the, not surprised the, by that yeah. That the fact that the number one far and away the number one result of what a girl needs to learn from her mother is how to have a relationship with Hashem. I was surprised, but pleasantly surprised, and not really surprised because the truth is, a lot of the questions that I was alluding to earlier, ultimately the only answer is about the spiritual fitness of the individual woman. At the end of the day, it's not about getting her husband to be different or getting her kids to be different or getting anyone else to be different. It's about her kasher with Hashem. Right. Okay, we have a few live questions we're going to get to. I want to start off with one question, and then we'll go into live, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. How do you want to do it? Okay, let's do first the first live question. I think it's a good question just to get going, and then we'll try to knock out a few lives. Again, anybody wants to ask a live question, please take out Asher Parnas or the birthday girl, and she will uh, put you on uh, the waiting list over here, and live questions go first. First question, what does the concept of the woman's rights mean in Yiddish, in the Yiddish idea, in the Jewish way? What is the role of a woman in our circles, the Taridik, the from, you know, what is their role? Isn't this discussion on a spot outside the world? We never had this problem figuring out what a woman was, right? 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it was pretty simple what a woman was, you know? Right. So what changed? Right. So I wonder if the, the question is a question on us, like, why are we even asking this question? Or if the question was more like acknowledging that it does need to be asked and sort of lamenting why, how did we get to this point where where it requires clarification? So who do you think the question was on? Was it on us or on uh, on our society? I would say really both. I mean, it's really intertwined. Us is our okay. society. That's what we live with. I, th I mean, I think we're asking the question because there 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 is a, a need to clarify. Look... <laughs> One aspect of this has to do with, it's interesting, by the way, how did financial pressure rank in the answer? Very low, 20%. Very low. Okay. So it's so interesting to me because a lot of this confusion comes from 
um, at least outwardly, comes from financial pressures to become two-income families. And that is something that changed Jewish families, I think, more than any other influence. So if you say, you know, my grandmother, my great-grandmother didn't need to ask what is a woman. She just knew what it was. She just intuitively understood her role. But then ask yourself the question, you know, did your great-grandmother have a job outside of the house? Did she have a degree? Did she have a career? Um, so a lot of it has to do with the pressure to have two income families, particularly in the communities where a lot of from people live, where we do live in communities that are more expensive. It's just one of the realities of being able to live near the resources that a from family needs. And it just sort of tends to go hand in hand with higher cost of living. And then there's also just uh, the standards that people have become accustomed to. And I'm not here to get into a whole discussion about inflated standards of living and things like that. Um, but there's no question that before there was such widespread acceptance of two income families, there was a lot more clarity about women's roles. You know, there, there's an issue that I don't even like to discuss because it causes pain to people who already are so conflicted and they're working so hard and they're trying to be so good and help their families. And so I hesitate to bring it up, but at the same time, I feel like it's a crisis. It does need to be brought up. And that is, um, think about Jewish children, babies, 50 years ago, certainly 100 years ago, how much time in the first, let's say, three years of their lives did they spend with their mothers? Like being held by their mothers or sleeping in the next room from their mothers and just being in the proximity. And when they cried, they were picked up by their mothers. And today... It's not as common as it once was. Once it was the default. Today we have many families where, again, because of financial pressures, we have children in daycare at four weeks old, 10 weeks old. Um, so you don't think some of that has, and, and I'm again, I'm not here to talk about this part of it. I'm just identifying if you want to say why are we even talking about women's roles and i'm just pointing out well look at what we have today it used to be so automatic it was just understood uh what the role of a mother was and today there's uh that's not as common so that's just one thing to to keep in mind but then there's another there's another aspect of it, and that has to do with the relationship between husbands and wives. Um, what does it mean for a woman to have a say, to be an adult with an with an opinion, and to be able to express herself? You know, is that a feminist thing? Is that a modern thing? Is that a non-Jewish idea that's crept into our society? Or is there a place for that? Is there a place for a woman to have an opinion and even to counsel her husband and that that's not only okay, but that's desirable? It's interesting um, when, when Chava was formed from other Mauritian so it says that she was taken from Hatzela, from the from the side. Some people translate it as a rib. It's not really a rib. It's a it's a side. It's his feminine side. But uh, the Mafarshim explained that Hatzela, the side, Adam's side, that turned into Chava, is the same letters as Leitza. Leitza means for advice. 
So a woman clearly is supposed to be an advisor. She's supposed to understand things and guide her husband. And we have to understand how that fits into a Torah family and a, a, a Torah marriage. Um, we know that Hashem told Avram Avinu that he should listen to Sarah. He told him everything that she tells you, you should listen to her. So we have we, we definitely have a model for that as well. Um, but but in answer to the question, you know, why are we talking about it? I think it's obvious why we're talking about it. And what I hope we can do tonight is get some clarity that's based on Torah so that we shouldn't have to worry about, well, is this idea of womanhood coming from the outside world or not coming from the outside world? That should become irrelevant. And it should become irrelevant because it shouldn't concern us. We should be so focused on what Torah tells us that when Torah happens to be consistent in some ways with what the world is doing today, great, let it be consistent. And when Torah is inconsistent with what the world does, great, let it be inconsistent. We're not here to please anybody. So I think it's very important that we just stay focused on what Torah has to say about about these concepts, which, by the way, I'll just mention, um, a lot of people, it's one of my pet peeves, by the way, in case you're listening, will ask me, people will come over to me and they'll tell me, I love your column, the Ami uh, column, and, and uh, oh, thank you so much, okay, and then they'll say, where are your sources from? And that's my pet peeve, because, I don't know, look at every column, did I ever bring a secular source? Or do I bring Mari McCoymes? Do I bring sources from Torah? And that's the point, is that if you don't look in the secular sources, you don't have to worry about going out of your way to be different than them. If you just don't look at them and don't know what they say, which is, Baruch Hashem, I can tell you that I don't keep track of these things. People think that I do. They always ask me questions about new modalities of this or that. I, I haven't the faintest idea of what is fashionable. I mean, I shouldn't say I haven't the faintest idea, although I do want to brag that I didn't know the Super Bowl was tonight until we were doing the prep for the class. And I said, how many people are going to have tonight? And they, and they said, well, we, we might be competing with the Super Bowl. So Baruch Hashem, I, I didn't know that I didn't know it was the Super Bowl. And, and I don't know necessarily, but I do know what a Super Bowl is. And I don't necessarily know what's fashionable in uh, the concepts of gender today. But uh, I do know that it's an area of confusion today. So the main thing is we have to go back to what Toyota tells us and don't worry about whether or not different sides of the culture war agree or disagree. That's not for us. The Jewish people should not be involved in this culture war. To the contrary, when the when the world is busy being confused and yelling back and forth at each other, we have to be the the beacon of light that just speaks straight clarity, clarity that's based on Torah. That's it. So I hope that answers the question why we're why we're even talking about this issue and why it's needed. Beautiful, Rabbi Tav. Okay, let's go to the first live question. You're on. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. So firstly, thank you, Rabbi Tao. I, I just want to clarify before I ask my question. Um, during the introduction, it was mentioned that you are part of Chabad. Did I did I just hear? I think where it was mentioned is that I am the scholar in residence at Chabad of the five towns. Yes, Baruch Hashem. Because um, I just on a separate note, I want to commend that the Lubavitch Rebbe, and I did get to meet him in person years ago, um, he elevated and empowered the role of the woman in a very beautiful way, obviously in line with Torah, but I, I always marveled at that. So that that's a side note. My question is this, I understand and appreciate your explanation of the woman's neshama receiving, taking in, right? 
what happens as a woman develops, let's say from girl, teen, young lady, married, and that neshama is developing in its essence. And then for whatever reason, she becomes either a single parent, a widow, uh, perhaps the wife of um, a husband who's ill. Does the neshama gain a strength or does the neshama transform so it can give in this duality, which is sometimes needed when the woman, and I'm not referring to working, because working is working. That's the outside world. But the essence of the home, right? The essence of the home is the woman. So I'd like to know if the neshama is transformed or if it takes on an extra power to accommodate the change in life. Thank yeah. You. Okay. By the way, you mentioned the Lubavitch Rebbe empowering women. So I should mention that last week was the Kines HaShluchais, not the Shluchim, but the Shluchais, the Chabad female emissaries from around the world. And this idea of women being leaders and having an influence in the world and transforming communities is such an important concept. And obviously you don't have to be a shlucha and move to uh, Timbuktu and start a Chabad house in order to do that. But it's it's an attitude that you have something to contribute and the way to contribute it is in your feminine way. You don't have to act like a man in order to be influential and to to contribute to the world. So that I'm glad that you you brought that up. Your question sounds like you're referring basically to women who are in a situation where they don't have, or it might seem they don't have the the, the male counterpart in their life. Like you said, either they're single, maybe they got divorced or, or they're um, widowed. You mentioned where they're, they have a husband, but he's not well. You didn't mention, but I will mention it sometimes they have a husband and he's physically well, but he's emotionally checked out. He's not available in the marriage. So it's almost like being a single mother. In fact, in some ways, it can be even worse. Um, that's certainly a very, very common situation where you have women. And I and I want to tell everybody here that, um, okay, so let me just say this. Just so everybody understands, I'm not a therapist. I don't want to hear anyone's problems. I, I I can't deal with hearing people's problems. It hurts me too much to hear people's problems. By some fluke that I've tried to get away with, get away from many times, I've tried to escape it many times. I end up hearing from people who are going through different issues. Okay, so I hear a lot. I hear a lot. I, 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 I'm so I just want to tell you something. If you're here tonight and you're listening to this and you're saying, I am a woman who either I don't have a man in my life or I have one, but for all practical purposes, I don't have one because I'm completely alone. I'm taking care of myself. I want you to know that. This is way more common than we care to acknowledge. Um, our community is not comfortable with the concept. We don't know what to do with the concept. Uh, we like the idea of an intact family where every, everyone's performing their role properly, and that seems to get the most attention, and that's where... Um, that's where we tend to to focus the various services that the community provides. And um, that's the sort of the rhythm of life is to cater to that to that type of family. But I want you to know that it is unfortunately extremely common. And I don't know that I have a solution here, and I'm I don't think I have to be the one who offers solutions to every problem. But what I can do, as somebody who I told you, I I hear a lot of stuff from a lot of people. 
I can describe the problem in a way that, first of all, may give some amount of comfort to people just to know that it's a real thing. And so there may be some degree of validation just hearing it described. But B, it might give you some clarity to understand exactly what it is that's so painful. As I mentioned earlier during my introduction, the feminine is uniquely suited for taking something small and developing it into something great. You think of a seed that you place in the earth. The seed is tiny, and it's placed in the earth, and it grows into a tree from which many fruits grow containing many seeds, which then grow many more trees with many more fruits. In other words, there's an infinite potential of fruits hidden, locked in that little seed, but it was only revealed by being planted in the earth. The earth is femininity. That's what femininity is. It takes that tiny little seed and it magnifies it and brings out its hidden potential. They say anybody can count the seeds in an apple, but only Hashem can count the apples in a seed. So w the infinite apples that, that are in the seed, that has to be re revealed by something. And what is the mechanism that reveals it? That's what, that's what femininity is. And that's what a woman, as an embodiment of femininity, is suited for, is uniquely um, capable of, and obviously, as such, will experience fulfillment and satisfaction doing that. It's not to say, by the way, I just want to make it clear, it's not to say that she can't also do other things. People are not monolithic. There is masculinity and femininity to all of us, man and woman. But a woman, by and large, is characterized by her femininity. And if she doesn't have that ability... It's a unique type of pain. In other words, there's a hunger, there's a desire to receive something so she can build it and turn it into something much greater. And when there's no mashpia, there's no masculine counterpart to her femininity, then there's a great aching and longing and... I want to tell you just honestly, I don't know if that particular aching and longing can be replaced. I think it can be offset by other ways of finding fulfillment. I don't think that means that this, this woman will have no, no accomplishments to be proud of in her life, God forbid. I think that there are many things that you see that women do where they make accomplishments in many different sectors of, of life and in, 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 in business and in education in in nonprofits. There's so many ways that women can make a contribution, but I just want to acknowledge that it might not be a public thing. It might not be things that, that the polite people discuss in public, but a woman who doesn't have that masculine counterpart, there is an undeniable lack. And at the very least, I think we need to be compassionate and recognize that it exists and um, and to know that there are many people who are suffering this way. So, like, again, I said, I don't have a solution to it, but I think sometimes it's helpful just to name it so people who are going through it can feel validated. And right, also, does Hashem give the, the question, does Hashem give the extra? Does, the extra, yeah, that, but that's, that's, a, that's always so, that whatever Hashem tests you with, Hashem gives you a kayak to deal with it. So, but what does that mean? It means, doesn't mean that it fills the lack. It means that you'll have the strength to be a productive, happy person in spite of the lack. She doesn't. She wants to say, wants to, before she unmute, I just want to say a very good news that just came out. Two Israeli hostages, the IDF released them, and they, they got them out of, yeah, two, alive. Yeah, Baruch right. Hashem. We should continue hearing more news like that yeah. until they're all, all right. out. You want, to, you want to mention something again? Amir. Yes, Rabbi Taub, thank you very much. You did answer a part of the question, but the core of my question, and this is with all respect to women 
who may still be single, who never got married, and I know plenty, and um, hope is on the way. I'm referring specifically when your role is changed from being a parent of a family together with your partner, and then things change, and now you have to give over that male and female energy. Right. We're not changing, we're not being feministic, but there's yeah. a need in the home. And right. you now have to stay feminine, but then develop this other part to raise the boys, to raise the girls, to get yep. the kids married. That's a whole other type of energy there. Yes. I'd like to know, does Hashem grant oh, us... Oh, so what your question was, does, does Hashem give the ability? See, I didn't understand what you meant. When you said, does Hashem give the ability, I thought you meant the ability to be able to get up in the morning and feel like there's purpose and that you can go on and survive another day. What you're asking it is a much more practical question. Will Hashem give the woman the ability to substitute and provide what the husband isn't providing? And the answer is, you know what? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. And we cannot provide, we cannot pretend that a woman who's providing, let's say you, you, you gave the example of raising her sons. We cannot pretend that it's the same. Now, will she be able to raise children who grow up to be healthy and happy and successful with Hashem's help. Yeah, we, we hope so. But let's, let's not pretend that it's the same. Let's not pretend it's go going to be the same experience for her, for her husband, for the children. So look, Hashem helps. We know this, but at the same time, I think we do ourselves a disservice by pretending that we don't need a mother and a father. Of course we need a mother and a father. And if it's in a situation where the father's not being a father, yeah, Hashem will give strength to the mother and somehow she'll be able to do her best. But it's still her best. It's her best. And God willing, the kids will be okay. But it's still her doing her best. It's not the best that he would be able to do if he would step up. And I think we need to acknowledge that because... You know, there are plenty of women, like you're saying, who are filling this role right now. And I don't think it's right to tell them that the bar is being set so high that they'll be they'll be able to substitute and replace anything that's lacking that their husband's not doing. I think that's just unreasonable to even suggest that to them. I think what we can say, which is comforting, is Hashem will help you, that you'll keep your sanity, that you'll be able to feel happy every day. Hashem will help you that your kids will come out okay and that they will be happy. But should we pretend that she'll be able to do everything that a, that a, that a man can do? I don't think that's fair to place that on her. Even if we're saying it in a nice way where we're trying to give her hope. Okay, Rabbi Tab, let's go to the next live question. Okay, you're on. Hi, thank you so much. I've been like reading your column and really enjoying it. Um, my question is, um, you know how you talk about that the woman is the mashpia and the receiver and there's like a big uh, cobble, yeah, cobble, whatever. So, um, and there's a whole like Laura Doyle philosophy where the woman has to embrace her feminine energy. So here's a disclaimer. I told you I'm not aware of not, secular Okay, choices. so let's skip. So so I know that it exists. I've heard the words, I, but you, if you're referring too much to it, I can't follow. Okay, so what happens when when a woman is more of the driving force is it more of a driving force and it works in the family. Everyone's happy, but she gets feedback from people around her or she wants her husband to be more taking initiative or making plans or doing things, but that's just not the nature of the personalities. Right. So it's like you have the personalities in play, but you have the masculine and feminine energy and there's no rules and the marriage has to work, but there, I don't know. So I'm curious your thoughts about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a, this is a classic question. And I don't want people to misunderstand my answer here. And I don't want you to think that I'm saying that a woman should downplay her competency. Like if she's capable of doing something, she should stand on the side and wait for her husband to step up. I, I'm not implying that. Um, what I am saying is that for the benefit of the home, that the energy should be right in the home there at least has to be some degree of mashpia makabal relationship where she is able to receive in a full way from her husband. Now, 
you're describing again a situation, a scenario where let's say that's not really forthcoming. And maybe it's because, you know, we spoke about the, the previous question was about where the husband's not really stepping up. So maybe he's incompetent. Or I'll give you another scenario. Maybe the husband is perfect, perfectly competent, but the woman is hyper competent. Like she's a real star. So whatever he's capable of doing, she's capable of doing 10 times more, right? But either way, there's a discrepancy, let's say, between what he's able to provide and what she's able to provide, or just a difference in energy. Just he can't match her energy. She's a real go-getter. And he's slower, more passive, more, more meek. So what do you do? All right. These are very delicate subjects. These are very delicate subjects, and I want to be very careful when we speak about this. I think it's helpful for women to know how men work. So I'm going to describe something to you, and maybe you'll recognize it, Maybe it'll be new to you, but I just want you to listen without prejudice and consider the following. Let's say you as a woman have a complaint that you want your husband to be more of a provider. And I don't mean financially. I mean, that could be one way men provide, but usually when there's a complaint about being a provider, it's about emotional energy, taking initiative, taking interest, um, making plans, um, getting stuff done, whether it's practical or even just on a purely emotional level, being the one who initiates a conversation or says, hey, you want to go out for coffee? But a woman is complaining that the husband's not stepping up. Okay. So you want him to step up. Great. And I want to share with you a secret. He wants to step up. He desperately wants to step up. Why does he want to step up? For the same reason that you want him to provide, he wants to provide. And that reason is because that's how Hashem made men and women. Like what I if, said before, Mashpia and Makabal. What if that's not the case? What if it's really not an issue in the marriage? So, 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 oh, you're saying it's not a problem? Everyone's happy? Everyone's happy, but it just... And leave it alone. Of, but because of like the nature of how things work, it like looks a certain way or... But it's funny because I read the question to my husband and he said, what's the problem? So like if if there's not but, a problem... Well, if he's saying what's the problem... It as it, if he's saying what's the problem... And you're also saying, what's the problem? I mean, you're saying, I don't see a problem. Is that but correct? Yeah, but it's more like, oh, society looks at it a certain way. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about so, it. So you just shrug, like, just like, if it works, it works, and don't even fall into this. If it works, it works. Always leave it. If everyone's feeling good, don't don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with it. People will make a comment. I would, I would by the way, if I can continue here, yeah, I sorry. would assert that if it's working for him and it's working for you, then there is a Mashpia Makabal dynamic going on. And it just may not be in the way that other people can recognize, but that's irrelevant because we're not here to perform our marriages on stage for other people to be the audience and to judge whether or not they think it's a good marriage. But if you're both satisfied, I would argue that there is certainly some type of provider recipient dynamic that is going on it just not it just may not be in the way that traditionally or typically we expect it spot on is that spot on spot on spot on okay but it's, i guess it's just like Whatever my husband says, I like learned so much from him and gained so much from him. But when it comes to making plans or let's do this or, you know, I'll just say I want flowers for my birthday and he'll buy me flowers. But then right. you know, other people will be like, well, you shouldn't say that. He okay. should Some, okay. Something like that. So this is great. Thank you for your honesty and vulnerability, because it's an opportunity for people to learn. So you will not get flowers from him unless you tell him to get you flowers. So one person will watch that from the sidelines and say, what a dysfunctional marriage. He should be the man. He should find out your flowers. He should get it. You should not have to remind him. And he should come through the door with the flowers. Okay. And they're going to convince you you have a dysfunctional marriage. God forbid. But what you're saying is 
that there is a healthy Mishpia Makabal dynamic in your relationship. It's just not about the flowers. Like you said, you learn so much from him. You do receive from him. You do appreciate what he gives you. And I, I in fact, I would go out on a limb and I'll say right now, if you could trade and your husband could become a guy who gets flowers, but doesn't provide for you in the ways that right now you're saying he, he does provide for you, would you switch? No way. I mean, no that, way. I, right. I, what I get no is so valuable. What you get is so much more valuable. So that's very important to understand that. And what I was saying before, if it works, it works. I said that just in general, if it works, it works, not knowing how in your particular case it works, but thank you for sharing so I can actually give an example. So you see here is a living example of how it works. He is providing. It's not flowers. It's not the, the ways that are very easy to sort of, you know, people who are watching from the sidelines, they only see the most obvious things that are that are there that are easy to observe. Like if a person gets up and they go to the store and they buy flowers and they come home and they bring the flowers home, that's very easy to see that. It's like you see the flowers, you see it happening. But the ways that he gives to you, you're saying are much more intangible. It's not physical. It sounds like it's much more spiritual, it's intellectual. Yeah. Right. So the outside observer doesn't see that. But you're not the outside observer. You're the one living it, and you don't have to see it. You're actually feeling it because you're getting from him. You're receiving from him, and that's why it's working. Right. It's just hard when, like, when there's this the out. It's I know I, I'm coming back to it, but when the outside world says, "Oh, like, wait for your husband to come up with a suggestion," or yeah, 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 it, don't listen husband, to them. Don't he doesn't listen like to them. that. If I when I try these tricks to him, he just got annoyed with me, and he's like, just. I don't play these games. Just tell me what you want. Yeah. So <laughs> a, a lot of, a lot of advice is inherently bad advice. And I'll tell you why, because, and you said you, you like my column. So if you read my column more than three times, you probably realized already that I never answer the question. I answer the questioner. The question, you could have 10 people ask the same question. It's never going to be the same answer. You answer the questioner because each person is different. Each situation is different. A lot of advice that people give is one size fits all advice. Always bring your wife flowers. Always be the one to suggest where you're going to go out to eat. Always be the one who says what which color my trip the, the family's taking. Well, that's one size fits all advice. That may not be applicable in your relationship. He doesn't want to do that. You don't want him to do that. You're not lacking anything from the fact that he's not doing it. In the meantime, he's giving to you in ways that for you are so much more meaningful that like I asked you, would you want him to switch and and follow the you know, the, the, the typical advice you're saying, no way, I don't want him to switch. What I'm receiving from him already is so much more valuable. I don't need the, the stuff that the typical marriage advice is describing. So just always remember every person is different. Every relationship is different. Do not try to live up to the general advice that's out there. Wow. It's hard. It's just hard to like, you know, it's just hard to like remember because if the way you're doing it is different than how everyone's saying it, it's just you're just like, oh, am I doing it wrong? Like, am I not right? Well, that's why, by the way, I started off, even though it bores everybody, I started off with the spiritual archetypes. Because here's the thing: if you start off with the particulars, like do this, do that, you're already wrong because if you have a hundred couples you're not going to have you're not going to have more than two or three out of a hundred who are going to have the same actions are going to be replicatable and reliably successful in 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 their marriages but if you understand the spiritual principles meaning the the, the fundamental idea that's behind it then you can realize that there are about a hundred different ways for this spiritual idea to be applied in 
in a practical relationship. You understand when you start with when you start with the spiritual idea, you realize there's so many different ways that it can be expressed. So in your case, if it's expressed by you enjoy your husband's wisdom and you like that he's slower and more calm and mellow, and when when he shares with you his insight, that for you is deeply fulfilling. You're very satisfied receiving that from him. And you don't need him to become the head counselor who's running around with a clipboard and a walkie-talkie. That's not what you're, you don't consider that to be giving. But there could be a woman for whom that is exactly what giving feels like. So that's why it's so important. We start from the general spiritual principles, and then we figure out how to bring those down the right way for the right people in the right situation. I think we should continue what you were saying for those that does make a difference. And you are putting it down very clear. Understanding that maybe. You know, oh, yeah. Where where they are lacking, where there is that that pain. Yeah. OK, so Baruch Hashem, I'm glad this situation was a was a happy story. But yeah. OK. All right, so let's talk about where there is a lack where a woman is feeling dissatisfied. Okay. So I think where I left off was I said, I want you to know that as much as you, the woman, have complaints, why is my husband not more of a provider? I really want him to be a provider. And again, provider, I mean, chiefly in the emotional sense. As much as you want that and you're yearning for that, he's yearning for that. He wants to be that for you. And why? Why does he want to be that way for you? Because that's the way Hashem made men and women. And there's just no way around it. And even if you have a woman who's more masculine and a man who's more feminine, which, of course, you have because femininity and masculinity is on a spectrum. And you see for yourself, there are women who are more feminine, less feminine, men who are more masculine, less masculine. Okay. So you could even have a shidduch where you have a woman who's on the less feminine side of femininity, married to a man who's on the less masculine side of masculinity. And yet I promise you when they are married, there's going to have to be some aspect of the relationship where he is masculine and she is feminine, which means mishpia, makabal, he's providing, and she is able to deeply receive what he is providing. And if she's not receiving it, <clears throat> she's not receiving anything, there will be a void and, and it will cause pain. Okay. So then what do you do? What do you do? See, here's what I want to tell you. For a woman who's not receiving any, let's call it emotional raw materials from her husband. Imagine you're a contractor and the guy who's supposed to deliver the, the lumber doesn't show up. So what are you supposed to do all day? You know, just wave a hammer in the air. Like you're waiting for the raw materials, right? So if you're the if you're the macabal, you're the recipient, you're waiting for someone to deliver the raw materials. Yeah, you'll take the lumber and you'll build a whole house. You'll make a mansion out of it, but somebody's got to give you something to work with, right? And he's not giving you anything to work with. Okay, I got it. And that's very painful. But here's the deal. Um Why does a man stop giving? And I, I hesitate to share this because every time I do, I, I upset people. And I just, before, before I continue, I want to explain something. I'm not blaming women. There's no blame here. I'm just describing a situation a situation which is painful for both sides. I'm explaining how it got that way, and I'm offering a possible way to break that cycle. There's no blame here. Okay, I want to make that very clear. A man stops giving for one simple reason, when what he is giving is not received. Imagine a teacher who walks into a classroom 
and the students are all listening with rapt attention and there's eye contact and they're taking notes and they're asking questions. They don't have to sit there and be silent. They're asking questions to the country. They're talking, explain this, explain that. And there's a lot of willingness and there's excitement, there's passion. They're receiving very deeply from the teacher. And then they're, they're, they're making comments that show that they received it because they're, they're putting two and two together and they're coming to new conclusions and new insights. And the teacher feels so excited and he's giving and giving and giving. And when he leaves that class, he feels energized. Well, why is he energized? He was just working so hard. He was just giving himself. No, because when you're a giver, it doesn't deplete you to give. It energizes you to give. Okay. But let's say the same teacher walks into a classroom and the students are not listening and they're chatting amongst themselves and maybe they're, they're checking their phones and they're getting up and walking around, slamming the door, making noise. If this teacher has any self-respect at some point, he's going to say, you guys don't want to hear me. I'm not having fun being here. Uh, I'm leaving. And that's it. And he's done. So, what happens is, again, with no blame, very often a man will come to a point where he feels that what he has to offer will not be received. And when he feels what, that what he has to offer will not be received, eventually he'll come to a point where he's incapable of offering anything. I want to make it clear very often a woman will suspect that as being a punishment that he's boycotting her he's sulking he's refusing okay so then therefore you're going to get nothing from me and i'm telling you that may happen in some cases but generally speaking it really just is a case of a provider feeling that there's no satisfaction in the recipient from whatever it is that he's providing and he dries up it, it, it's like nursing. When the baby is nursing, then you'll always be able to make more milk. The baby's not nursing, then you're done. There's, you can't make more. So what do you do when you're in this situation, which is very painful for both sides and very dysfunctional? Um, there has to be a way of breaking the cycle. And to break this cycle, very often you have to start with something minuscule, with something tiny. And that means to find something that he is providing. It could be the smallest thing and receive it deeply, receive it fully, receive it with desire. It could even be Something tiny, like comes home from shul and he says, you want to hear a vort? So instead of being put off or frustrated, like, you know, there were a hundred things I needed from you earlier today that you were totally nowhere to be found. And now you want to come in and tell me a vort. It's like not the right time, not the right place. I'm not in the mood. All right. Instead of thinking that, you can think to yourself, okay, listen, no, it's not ultimately the, the, the thing that I want from this guy is he should tell me a word, but I've got to start opening the flow. I need this. I need the pipeline to open again. And if I can take a trickle and I can pull it toward me, then there's something called momentum. And eventually it will build strength and it becomes a virtuous circle where he gives more, it's received more, and then he's able to give more. So it's such, a, it's such an art, but the art of being a true recipient is finding something that the mashpia and, and specifically an inactive mashpia is providing, however minuscule, and receiving it deeply with desire so that it triggers more of that provider's instinct in the provider.
Now, having said that, I want to make something very, very clear. Very clear. Because a woman is the recipient in this dynamic, she needs safety. When you're the recipient, when you're the one who's allowing the energy into you, so then you need to be safe. When, when you're the one putting the energy out, it just goes out there, and if it's received, it feels great. If it's not received, it feels embarrassing. Okay, But if you're the one where the energy is coming into you, if it's not good energy, it's actually very harmful. So here's the art, and it's I'm not jealous of being in this position. It's a very delicate balance. While you're trying to find that which your husband is providing that you can receive deeply, at the same time, you're not doing yourself a favor, and ultimately, you're not doing him a favor by having poor boundaries and receiving anything that is disrespectful or dangerous. So it's such an art. It's like almost like you have to do two opposites at the same time as a woman to be able to receive from your husband, because if there's no mishpia makabal dynamic, the whole thing falls apart. But at the same time, you can't be so open that you're receiving things that don't feel safe and don't feel respectful. And I think that a lot of what women need to be encouraged to do is to have enough self-awareness about what, I'll, I'll use the, the technical spiritual term, but hashpa, the mashpia gives hashpa, influence. What influence or what emotional energy um, feels okay to receive and to try to receive that as deeply as possible and what emotional energy does not feel okay to receive and to have the discernment to not open yourself up for it because if you if you allow yourself to be um disrespected that's certainly not going to lead to a greater bond to the contrary if you tolerate disrespect then you will build thicker walls out of self protection you're going to have to and then you want, you know, when you'll have those thicker walls, it, built, it becomes even harder to receive. And then you get more and more locked into this situation where he's not giving. And even if he were, you're not available to receive it because you don't feel safe. And that to me is like the real dilemma where things get really, really stuck is when the husband's not an active giver anymore because he's given up. And the woman has such thick and high walls of protection that even if he gave something, she wouldn't be able to let it in. And the art is being able to selectively, with discernment, receive that which feels okay to receive. I, I, I hope this makes sense. We'll have to reach out to you to further explanation. But here's a question, maybe it, it helps. Somebody said that I'm struggling with the idea of tzinius. The only thing that I heard about growing up is how bad it is. For, you know, you have to make sure tzinius, tzinius, tzinius all day. Why am I judged and looked at the way I dress? Just because the men out there have a hard time. Why is it my problem? Okay. This is one of the big questions that um, Jewish women struggle with. They're told all the time about Sneas. And very often it's in a context of you are a problem and you need to be more Sneas in order to offset this problem that you're causing other people. All the problems are because women are not covering up. Okay. So first of all, I'm not going to get into a discussion about whether or not I think that that's a sound educational method to guilt people. If I, I mean, well, I mean, I'll just tell you right up front. I don't think that if Tzniyas is a valuable value, I don't think it's an effective way to teach it by making people feel bad about themselves. I think there are ways of empowering people. But Let's let's talk about Sneas. I have a parenting course, and 
in from my parenting course, we have a a group of alumni, people who graduated the parenting course. And we have a group of mothers who meet once a month online. And they're all people who have who've taken my six week online course. So it's uh it's a, it's a high level group. And we talk about deep stuff there. And um recently the subject one month was Tsnias. It came up. And a, a mother was expressing frustration with like there's so much pressure to teach this to our children. And I feel like I'm like I'm a cop. This mother was saying I'm like in this position of constantly policing Tsnias, and it's like it becomes counterproductive. This is a from woman. She she cares about Sneas, but she just doesn't see that it's productive to constantly be playing cops and robbers with checking her daughter's uh, clothes before she leaves the house. It's backfiring. So I I offered them the following perspective, and I think this is something that, that's helpful to re, re, to reflect upon. Sneas is a value, not a behavior. What's the difference between a value and a behavior? A value is an idea. A behavior is an action. So, in other words, the values that I have, the ideas that I hold dear, will guide me in choosing the behaviors that I want to act according to in order to uphold my value, okay? So, for instance, let's say kindness. Kindness is a value. It's an idea. How do you act upon it? Well, there are different behaviors. The behavior could be giving tzedakah. The behavior could be giving a loan, which is different than tzedakah. The behavior could be bikr choylem. It could be um, visiting a friend. It could be inviting someone to your house. You understand an idea can be expressed in many different behaviors. So I I asked these mothers because tsnias is a, is a, is a value meaning an idea then it should be expressed or at least it's capable to express it in many different behaviors. Could you identify for me a behavior, an action, which is an expression of the value of Tznias that has nothing to do with clothing, that has nothing to do with elbows and knees? So this was a, a very new way of looking at it. Hold on a second. I thought Tznias was all about skirt length. Okay. Well... That's one behavior, the way you dress. Yes, that's one behavior. But if something is a value, then a value can be expressed in many different behaviors. I'm not discounting, by the way, that there's there are proper ways of dressing. I'm just saying it's not the only way of expressing this value. And, and here's why I, I brought it up as a thought experiment. That when you teach a behavior instead of a value, you're teaching the what instead of the why. And when you teach the what instead of the why, then the person doesn't know the meaning of what they're doing. And they become resistant. But if you teach the why, then not only is the person going to be motivated to carry out the what, but the person will be able to figure out how that why can then be applied in many different what's. It's not just one behavior. It's not just one thing that you do that, sh that shows that you're tznias. So uh, what is tznias? One translation you could say is modesty. Yeah, people say modesty. Um, I might call it Self-respect. I might call it being comfortable with your boundaries. 
And that value could be expressed in many different behaviors. So I asked the mothers, give me a behavior that would express that value that has nothing to do with clothing. We discussed it for a while. One of the mothers came up with an incredible example. She said, not needing to be the center of attention. There's a group of people all talking and people are saying interesting things and they're getting a laugh and they're getting a reaction and being content just to be present and not needing to be the person that people are focused on and getting a reaction. Once she said that, it clicked for everybody. Oh, now we can start thinking about what SNES really means because we were locked into one very specific behavior, and it's almost like the whole concept, this beautiful concept of self-respect, of, of ha having firm boundaries, of, of dignity, which that's what SNEAS really is. It became reduced to this one very specific behavior, and then we were like locked into just the behavior, and we'd lost touch with the deeper meaning, which is a beautiful meaning. But when we went back to the idea and said, now trace the idea back down, not to the same behavior that we were talking about, but to a different behavior, it, it, it liberated our minds to be able to think about this idea now in, in a way where there's something deep, there's something meaningful here. It's not just how many inches of, of, of skirt length. Yeah, that's one way that it's expressed. But there are so many ways that it's expressed. So I think we need to teach the why. We need to teach the value, the idea, the spiritual concept of everything in Torah. And then the what will become so much more pleasurable. It'll become, it, it, I mean, I, I'm not promising it'll become easy, but at least it'll have enough meaning that you'll want to do it. So I, I think we need to speak about specific about SNES, which became so synonymous with very specific behaviors. I think we need to re-educate ourselves about the subject as an idea. And then after we've understood what is this as an idea, SNEAS is not a skirt length. SNEAS is self-respect. SNEAS is boundaries. SNEAS is self-contentment, that I'm okay. I'm emotionally autonomous. I don't need anybody else's reaction in order to feel like something. That's what it is, and it's a beautiful concept. And there's so many different behaviors that are influenced. A person who truly has the middle of SNEAS, that will reflect, that will be reflected not just in what they dress, how they speak, vocal tone, the words they choose, the, the, the way they walk, the way they think, even the, the, the way that they, the way they eat, the way they sleep. It, it, the, a value can be manifested in so many different areas of life. So I, I think this is just another example. There are many, many other examples, but probably the most egregious example of where a beautiful concept became reduced to its most observable, quantifiable, physical action. And we need to go back and relearn it as a concept so then we can start applying it properly to, to the behavioral realm. Yeah, Robert, let's go to this next question. Very powerful question over here that came in. I work in an office with men and women. There are a few men that are very from, but for some reason they sit around and talk and joke with everybody. Don't they understand boundaries? Boundaries in the workplace. You know, this is a question that I've heard so often from women and never from men. And I think it's because it's a blind spot for men. Um, I mean, what you're describing there, it sounds like a scenario where you have a bunch of from people. So... Like everybody's aware of halacha, and not only they're aware of halacha, that, but, but to their knowledge, they're following it. Now, I've had women tell me, I, I'm working with men who 
they would never, ever, ever be over on Yichud, right? Because that they know. You, you don't be alone in, 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 a, in a room. Like, they know these things, right? But there are subtleties of the energy that they're putting off, which is inappropriate. And, and, and here's what I want to explain about that. Remember I was saying before that because a woman is a, is a makabal, a woman's a recipient, the experience of a recipient is inherently different than the experience of a provider, of a mashpia. Inherently different. Like I was saying before about when a husband is not providing emotionally for his wife, um, so you know, the dissatisfaction that a mashpia has when he's not able to provide anything is very different than the dissatisfaction that the macabre has when she's not receiving anything. And then I also pointed out that because she's the recipient, she also has to be more guarded. She has to be more selective. She has to have more firm boundaries because after all, at the end of the day, it's coming into her. She's letting it into her. So she's got to be discerning she's got to have standards okay this question about sneas in the workplace which again i'll translate sneas the way i did 10 minutes ago as self-respect emotional autonomy boundaries being okay with yourself it should be obvious to anyone who's who's intellectually honest that if you understand the difference between male and female, that the experience of these boundaries is so inherently different when you're the one who's the recipient. Men put off energy, and they're almost clueless about the energy that they're putting off. They make a comment um, that they don't know. And, and I want to tell you something, by the way, women. Um, there are some men who do know that they're making inappropriate comments. That's true. Okay. But there are plenty of men who do not understand that certain comments are, are flirt, are flirt, are flirtatious because they're, they're personal. They're a detail that is something that's more than just technical. And the tone of it um, is just too familiar and they don't know that they're doing it. Why don't they know they're doing it? Because when you're the one putting out the energy, so you just put it out. But when you're the one that's receiving it, it lands very, very differently. So what happens is it becomes the responsibility of women to be the ones to constantly enforce the boundaries. And that's not really fair. It's not really fair. That's why we need to educate young men to understand much more how careful they must be to not encroach upon women's boundaries. Now, you know, in the world today, I'm saying the outside world, they're finally so, sort of sort of beginning to understand how maybe we're not so crazy, us Yidin, having things like Shema Nagia and Yichud and all these things because of all the problems that they have from these from these issues, right? Maybe having gedora, maybe having boundaries is not such a crazy idea, right? But on a more subtle level, even in very from environments, there are ways of, of, of reaching the spirit of the law. Perhaps not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. And we need to educate men be much more aware of the fact that certain types of interactions are violating. What do I mean by violating? Violating sounds like such a scary word. I'm, I'm going to explain it very simply. If I accidentally walk into your house, that's embarrassing. But if you, a stranger, I'm saying, I'm a stranger and I accidentally walk into your house, so I'm embarrassed. That's very embarrassing. I accidentally walked into your house. Sorry. And I leave. But if a stranger accidentally walks into my house, it's my house. I was 
sitting at the at the kitchen table having a cup of tea and a stranger walks in, that's terrifying. You you understand the difference? One is embarrassed, the other is terrified. What's the difference? Upon whom the encroachment occurred. So did you come into my domain? Then that's much more unsettling. And because of the nature of Mashpia and Mechabal, which is unavoidable, it is just the way that Hashem made male and female energy, the woman is always going to be the one who has more of the negative experience from the fallout when these boundaries are not properly maintained. And I'll add, by the way, even if she'll insist that she doesn't mind, and maybe on some level she doesn't because, you know, a person has different desires. And, uh, you know, like Tanya teaches, there's the Nefesh Alakis and the Nefesh Bahamas, the godly soul and the animal soul. And maybe the animal soul even enjoys the interaction. But it doesn't mean that no damage is occurring. It is occurring. And when I say damage is occurring, I don't mean in a scary fire and brimstone way like you'll be punished for it. What I mean is that the act itself is punishment enough. It's violating a sensitivity. It's an encroachment. It's an invasive move. And it will have a negative effect. Of course it will. Of course it will leave a negative effect. So... Men, be more aware, be more aware and more respectful of women's boundaries. Women, be more confident. Um, Don't let anyone confuse you or gaslight you into feeling like you're being unreasonable by needing stronger boundaries. If you're thinking maybe perhaps you need stronger boundaries to be comfortable, I promise you, you 100% for sure do. If you're even considering maybe there need to be better boundaries, then they're for sure do. And you should never feel embarrassed about asking for that respect. And somebody who can't afford that respect, that's not a safe person. Very, very deep. Beautiful. Okay, let's go to the next live question. You're on. Hi, Rabbi Taub. Thank you for coming with us again. So my question is more on the Mikabal Mashpia relationship in the dating scene, in the dating stage, um, is there anything, you know, that one, that, you know, people going out together could enhance their experience together, you know, go, uh, in, in dating, knowing the mechanics of Mashpia and Mikabal? Yeah. And is there a way to... Because, I mean, usually it's the man that does everything. I don't know if there is, if it's Nias or not Nias to get anything back on a date. And is there a way to, uh, like, a test someone could feel this is the one by having a Mikabo Mashbia type of uh, sense? Yeah. Like, this is the one that matches, this is the one that's meant to be. Yeah, I mean, what you're what you're describing essentially is chemistry. And, you know, thank God the way that, Jewish people date is that the first thing we check out is values, because that really is the most important thing. But then after values check out, then there has to be some type of chemistry. And chemistry means that the man is the provider and the woman is the recipient. And even if she's a very confident and competent and skilled and proficient woman, she at least has some feel. Rabbi Tab, unmute. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why I muted. That even if she's very, very confident and competent and skilled and proficient, there has to be some area in which she feels that she's getting something from him. And for him, the deepest satisfaction is to know that he's providing that. So what is it? What does it look like? Like we were we were saying earlier, it could look like so many different things. It could be that he buys her flowers, like the 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 woman who was saying before, like that's the classic example. He buys her flowers, and she was saying, "I don't even care about that. I don't need that." Um, you know, in her case, she was saying he tells he he tells me things that are deep and and wise, and, I, and to me, that's so satisfying. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be he holds the door for her. It could be that. He offers her insight. It could be he just gives her attention. It could just be 
um, tell me about your day. And he listens well. But there has to be some energetic flow going from him to her. And if you want to talk about successful dating, what is chemistry? What does it come down to? In every single case, it is this. If it's not there, things always schlep. When it is there, things go smoothly. This is also, you know, something that, I mean, I'm not, a dating coach and I'm not a shadchan, but like I mentioned earlier tonight, for some reason, as much as I've tried to avoid it and get away from it, people come to me with a lot of issues in their lives. So I hear a lot of stuff and no, I'm not a therapist and no. Okay. But Hashem seems to put me in a place where a lot of people tell me a lot of things. Okay. So I've probably been front row to, I don't know, thousands of shidduchim. Um, And I'm going to tell you something. Very, very often, they'll have a good guy with a good girl on paper. Everything should work. The parents want it to work. The shadchan for sure wants it to work so they can finish up and get paid. <laughs> but it's not going because he doesn't know how to initiate in any way. He's responding. He's following. And it's deeply unsatisfying for both of them. So it's interesting because I was saying a few minutes ago about Sneas in the workplace specifically, but it could be anywhere, how men have to be super, super careful to not leak their energy where it's not wanted and, and invited. Dating is this weird thing where, you know, you're not supposed to, a man is not supposed to look at a woman. Well, when he's considering for, for, for her for marriage, then he should. Okay. Uh, why should a man not look at a woman? So, because it's us, sir. I know, but why is it us, sir? Because when he does that, he's taking. When a man is nen, when he has hano, when he derives benefit from a woman by looking at her, he's taking. And that's not a healthy relationship. Meaning, I'm not saying that a man can never receive anything from a woman. You know, maybe, you know, uh, you know there could be a situation. Uh, who, who has a pencil? Here, I've, no, don't give me a pencil. You're a woman. No, that's not what I mean. But I mean, specifically in, in, in a context where he's a man and she's a woman, meaning specifically in this where he's looking at her beauty. So it's clearly that it's he's a man, she's a woman. So the reason that that is also is because it's deeply unsatisfying because he's receiving from her. He's taking from her. I, I spoke about this at length last time I was here and I spoke to the men about the private relationship between husbands and wives on various levels and how important it is for men to be the givers and not to take, not to try to extract benefit or satisfaction. Okay. So here's the thing. The ultimate satisfaction that the giver receives is when what he gives is received. So here's the thing. If he's just going out with her and he's excited about the fact he's going out with a girl, that's a turnoff. Why is it a turnoff? Because he's receiving. He's just excited about the fact that he's got this nice girl with him. So he's taking from her. But if he's giving to her, if he says to her, you look so nice. I, that's such a nice dress. He's giving to her. She feels that she's received something. When he feels that what he gave her is received, that makes him feel like a man. And then there's chemistry. So it's so important to realize that we cannot violate these ironclad laws. There's, there's no, you know, red light camera ticket that you're going to get if you violate it. You're not going to get a letter in the mail a week later, the picture saying that you violated Mishpia Makabal dynamics. Instead, what happens is things are just frustrating and disappointing 
and nobody knows why. So the more we understand these spiritual laws, the more we can work with them instead of working against them. Okay, well, let's go to the next question, Rabbi Tao. Hi, sir. Hi, hi, Rabbi Tao. Hi. hi you know, listening to you earlier, I have that feeling that um, you know, maybe so, uh, listening to some of the questions of the women, um, and probably myself included, maybe that some that just don't relate to the female role. That it could be their personality, but it could be the upbringing. Where the, those of us, and I, I'll say it freely, I grew up neglected. And you know, my for many years, I you know, really t you know, I've been working up to almost take on the male role. But but this thing is, how do you, how, how can some women like cultivate certain feminine traits, or, you know, yeah. without sacrificing their own personality and things like you know, is it, yeah, because it seems like you know, well, I didn't grow up from, so I didn't have the role models or the the strong gender roles as it is. But I'm coming in, I feel like you that, you know, they maybe want this cute, I, I don't know, certain types that I just, you know, that I don't, uh, I, I'm not disparaging or anything. I, you know, I respect, you know, a lot of women I admire, but I know that I could never be like them. So how do you cultivate certain? Yeah. Well, I'm really glad. First of all, thank you for your honesty and your vulnerability. And, you know, the fact that you uh -huh. mentioned that you grew up neglected, I think that's really important. I'm glad that you yeah. mentioned that because, um, Let's talk about what happens specifically to a woman who's neglected because it's it's damaging for little boys and for little girls to be neglected. Yeah. But let's talk I, I, about specifically yeah. Yeah, what happens to a little girl who's neglected. Yeah, because I just want to say in the free world, yeah. the man, there might, I mean, there are plenty of men, of course, who grow up neglected. They at least have the masculine environment of the synagogue. But, it, you know, they, they could be the minion, but a lot of, or she, but a lot of women. Well, I'm going to, I'm, I'm talking about busy. something even deeper than yeah. that. I'm not just talking yeah. about the lack of role models because, yeah. um, like you're, like, like you're saying, you didn't grow up in a from environment. So even if you hadn't been neglected, you wouldn't have received a traditional uh, Jewish role model. And yet that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when you grow up neglected, you are forced to become hyper competent. Mm -hmm. you're forced to become an adult way earlier than you would have. You're forced to never rely on anyone and never trust anyone when you're neglected. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how does that affect little boys? They grow up and they become um, big macho men who don't rely on anybody. Mm -hmm. And it's a character defect and it's a result a result of their trauma, but it kind of works out if you're a man because you can sort of just play it off as masculinity. Yeah. If you're a woman and you were a neglected little girl and you grow up, <clears throat> remember I spoke about before about the, the, the thickness of the walls, that when a woman has those thick, high walls where she cannot open up to receive from her husband. So if you're neglected, your walls are so thick and so tall. They have to be because if they weren't, you wouldn't have survived to adulthood. Mm -hmm. So the way that girls are affected by neglect and abuse as well um, is that it makes it specifically difficult to receive. And this is one of the issues that I wish people were more aware of. How many marital problems come down to a woman's inability to receive because she doesn't feel safe because of neglect or abuse that happened to her when she was a child? So before I talk about what can be done about it, I just think it's really super important to stop and even acknowledge that this exists particularly because I don't think it's super uncommon. Unfortunately, I I see it way, way more often than I think most people listening would like to believe that it happens. Okay. And, and it's profoundly unsettling when it, when there's a dynamic like this in a marriage, because the woman can't receive and, 
and she's she's unable to open herself up to her husband. And when she can't receive from him, from him and open herself up to him, then obviously everything falls apart. There's no much be a macabre dynamic. Mm -hmm. So I want to just reiterate, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a therapist. I don't even read books about psychology. So mm -hmm. people are going to say, why don't you speak about trauma and healing? Why? Because I'm not qualified to speak about it. Okay. I'm a rabbi. I'm going to just speak. I'm going to stay in my lane and I'm just going to speak about the spiritual aspect here. If you are a woman who finds it difficult to trust and receive, mm -hmm. then it is very important to fill that with a rock solid trust in Hashem. Mm. Your relationship with, with Hashem mm. becomes the key to your healing because mm. that is the source of your security. We'll and right when now, you yeah. feel security, mm -hmm. then you will be able slowly, gently, mm. not don't rush yourself, but you mm. will be able to open yourself up to human beings. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. Human beings are not Hashem. Human beings are unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Human beings will disappoint you. Human beings will accidentally hurt you. Mm -hmm. There's, In fact, some human beings will purposely hurt you. That's part of life. That's part of vulnerability is that risk. But when you have a sense that my worth is based on something that doesn't change, that I have value in the eyes of mm -hmm. Hashem, and you feel that constant solidity and security, that will allow you to begin to open yourself up to people, which is without it, there's no way to have an intimate relationship. Thank you. Keep that in mind. Hey, Robert, let's go to the next question. Yeah. Second. Hi. Hey, hi. I wanted to ask, what's a woman's role when the husband is in an inappropriate websites or things? What's the Torah perspective, um, what's the answer from the Torah for yeah. these women? I know a lot of friends. I'm not the only one, so I just want to know what the answer is. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is way more common as well than people would care to admit. Um, it's rampant. And anybody who takes exception with me saying that it's rampant, either God has blessed you with blissful ignorance, and I envy you, or there's some ulterior motive why you would try to cover this up. Because it is a crisis, I'm not saying it's happening in every marriage, God forbid. But if it's something that I'm hearing on a daily basis, does that is that not indicative of something that's way too common? Okay. So this is a very serious issue. And it destroys the intimate relationship between the husband and the wife. And let me explain how it destroys it. I mentioned before, it's all about giver and recipient. It's all a shpia makab. When a man is looking at inappropriate things, whether it's real people or pictures or whatever, he puts himself into the role of a recipient. He's taking. He's not giving anything. He's not offering anything. He's purely just taking. That, that role that a man puts himself into, you think that he can just drop that and shed that and all of a sudden become, flip around and become a provider in his relationship with his wife? That's not what happens. What happens is he, he takes that same energy into his relationship with his wife and he tries to take from her. He uses her in the, or he attempts to use her 
in the same way that he's using the inappropriate websites. In other words, she becomes an object. She becomes a source of gratification. And he's completely selfishly just trying to take and take and take. Now, once that happens... You tell me how successful the relationship's going to be. He just completely inverted the whole Mishpia Makabal relationship. So I, 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 I don't want to make people feel worse than they already feel because a lot of the issue regarding this has to do with shame. And when people get stuck in shame, unfortunately, it doesn't make them change their ways. It actually gets them stuck in their ways. So I'm not trying to make people feel even worse. But I am trying to speak a truth that a lot of people need heard, maybe just because they're suffering in silence and isolation, and they need at least to have it validated that this is happening. So here I am being that voice to say, yes, it's happening. And, and it's, and it's so profoundly damaging to the intimate relationship. Okay. So what, what, what do you do if you're in this situation? I mentioned earlier that because a woman is a recipient, she has to be guarded about what she receives. She has to have boundaries. She cannot allow herself to be disrespected. I cannot give you step-by-step -step instructions of what this actually means on a practical level. For that, you will need to speak to your Das Toyota and to be guided. But what I can tell you is that you need to be safe. You need to feel secure. You need to feel that you are not going to be subjected to anything that is humiliating or, or objectifying, whether it's being done to you or it's being done on a computer in the next room or it's being done somewhere else, but it's being done by the person who you're sharing a life with. The number one thing I can tell you is you can't control what he's doing. You can't control what he's doing, but you have to feel safe. That is the number one priority. You have to feel respected and you have to know what your boundaries are. And boundaries are very different than ultimatums. An ultimatum is to tell somebody, if you do such and such, then here's what I'm going to, how I'm going to respond to you. Like, it's a threat, basically, an ultimatum. Like, if you do this, then I'm going to do that. And then, you know, you see if they'll call your bluff, and they usually do. Huh? A boundary is, if you do such and such, just so you know, heads up, Here's what I'm going to have to do for myself. I'm not doing it to you. I'm not doing it as a response. I'm doing it for my own dignity. And, and, and that's what's extremely important in these cases, that you know what you're okay with and what you're not okay with. And that you feel that not only it's all right for you to, to, to respect your boundaries, but it's actually your obligation to respect your boundaries and to communicate that. And if you don't feel that you can do that, then I really, really urge you to get help, to reach out to somebody, to some source of support, a professional, a family member, a rabbi, somebody who can give you the confidence to say, here's what I'm comfortable with. Here's what I'm not comfortable with. A man writes over here that, that a lot of men that do this stuff they don't have the right recipient, and then the woman complained. Women need to know that they caused it to happen. Yeah, so I've heard that claim many times, and um, I reject that claim. And maybe some men will be upset, but I reject that claim. And I'll reject that claim because what excuse did you use when you were a bachar? So don't tell me if my wife were such and such, if she were this, if she were that, then I wouldn't be nichshel. It doesn't hold water. Um, and I and I want to make it very clear because unfortunately women struggle with this so much. Women blame themselves. 
They really, really blame themselves. And they feel, they really believe if I were different, if I were more, then he wouldn't be nichshal. He wouldn't stumble this way. And I want you to know it's not true. A man is as moral as he wants to be. Okay? He makes a choice. He has free choice. It's between him and Hashem. You are not the cause of it. You are not the cause of it. Okay, just one more topic on this, then we'll go. We have two more live questions, and it's not getting late. Somebody said that based on the logic, there should be nothing wrong with a woman watching it. That's very interesting. It's damaging in a different way, but certainly not in the same way that it's damaging for a man. Um, there are certain things that are damaging on an essential level because it is antithetical to who the person is. For a man receiving pleasure from intimacy that's not the pleasure he's getting back from what he's giving is antithetical to his essence. And that's what makes it so damaging for him. For a woman, it's damaging, but not in the same deep way. Of course it's damaging and it's forbidden and she shouldn't do it, but it's not an absolute perversion of her essence in the same way that it is for a man. And you see, you see, when a woman is exposed to these things, it's very rare that that takes her entire ruchnias down. But every single day, unfortunately, we see how not only Bochram, but younger light who get attached to these things. It doesn't just become an issue. It actually takes down their entire ruchnias. So why does it have such a, 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 a different effect on men than women? You see, it's more damaging for men than for women. I'm not saying it's okay for women. I'm just saying it's damaging in a different way. Okay, hey, Rabbi let's hop around a few more questions. Let's, uh, it's getting late. Okay, on mute. Hi. Hello? You're, you're unmuted. You could speak. Try it again. I'm here. Who's on mute? Hi. This mic is not working. Okay. This mic's not working. Okay, let's get one more question in and then we'll go to closing. So the mic starts working. Oh, one second. Okay, one more person also. Nice one. Okay, I want to do this question. As a woman, I feel second class. Everything revolves around the learning of the men and is being raised, B'nai Torah, making sure the boys are amazing tzaddikim, but the girls, they're taught to raise them, to cater to them, and to take care of all the errands and run the ship while the men are sitting on the front deck. I'm just here for technicalities. A woman feels like she's more of a technical thing and everything is revolving around the man's role. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody mentioned way at the beginning of the program about uh, the Lubavitch Rebbe and the Shluchais, or maybe she mentioned the, the Rebbe and I mentioned the Shluchais, but you see the, the Rebbe's emissaries, he sent out couples where they're equal partners in the operation, and in many ways the women are doing more than the than their husbands. You know, who's the real heart and soul of the Chabad house is the Shlucha. She's the one who really runs it. He's, he's, he's the rabbi. He gives the, the sermons, but she's the one who really runs it. Um, so I'll just speak very quickly about this, about women's Yiddishkeit and feeling like a woman's, a woman's Yiddishkeit is only valued as an accessory to her husband. That doesn't really work. And I'll say that with the disclaimer of if that's what you're doing and you're satisfied, then I'm not interfering. And it's great. But you see that today it doesn't work. And what happens is, I've observed this, today you have women who are very, very bright, very sensitive, very deep, but their level of Jewish education is proportionately insufficient. 
And what I mean is like this, you know, not everybody is brilliant. Not everyone's a genius. So if you're not the biggest intellectual, so you don't need that much intellectual depth in your Yiddishkeit, you'll be fine. But what about women who are intellectuals? A man who's an intellectual who was raised in the yeshiva system, gener generally speaking, will have been given enough intellectual substance within a Jewish framework that his Yiddishkeit is commensurate to his intellectual level. And yet we find so many times women who their level of capacity intellectually is way beyond what they actually have as far as their Jewish education. They have basic rudimentary technical knowledge, but not the type of depth that they really require. And then what happens? Sometimes they just become uninspired and things unravel from there. And then God forbid, even their observance of practical mitzvahs suffers. Other times, um, they maintain what they have to maintain outwardly, but they look for intellectual stimulation elsewhere, and they become enamored with secular ideas and the latest self-help books, and they use that to stimulate themselves. And it's a disaster because, you know, we mentioned at the very beginning of the program about women feel more of a burden regarding chinuch habonim, because the reality is that women are the primary educators of the next generation. So if women don't have a deep Yiddishkeit, conceptually deep, then they're not going to be able to raise the next generation and to answer the questions that the next generation is asking. And what happens is the entire Jewish people suffers from this. So in our day and age, it is extremely important that women have, and, and again, I'm saying commensurate to each person's ability. If somebody's not an intellectual, then fine, then they don't need to study such depth. But if you are a woman who is intellectually deep, then you need to fill that capacity. It must be filled. I, I, I'll just mention, at the risk of self-promotion, but... Um, I give a class in the five towns. Actually, I'll advertise two of the classes that I give. Mondays, 11 a.m. Uh, in Tanya for women. Wednesdays, 11 a.m. We learn my modem, Hasidic discourses. It's a women's class as well. And the level of study, I always tell my students in that class because they don't, they don't, they 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 don't know what. It's like in yeshiva, so I, I tell them, I, I want you to know the level of discourse in these classes is beyond what the, what the advanced uh, rabbinic students are studying. And in case you want to test it out and see if I'm, uh, you know, you're listening and you're saying, is it really so deep? So I'll encourage you, you can go to soulwords.org. Here I'm really self-promoting. You can go to soulwords.org. S-O-U-L-W-O-R-D-S, soulwords.org. That's my website. It's all my shooting. Or if you have YouTube, you can go to youtube.org slash soulwords. Or you can go on Spotify or Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts and go learn these classes. And you'll hear women asking questions and getting answers. So it's incredibly important that women are given that women who have the capacity for it are given the depth of Jewish education that they are capable of, of receiving. And when they're not given it, that vacuum, that void, like I said, causes repercussions for, for the next generation. So it's incredibly important. And I've, I've devoted personally, a, I'm not a woman, but I've devoted a lot of my attention and time into the education of women because it's that valuable. Okay, Gavaldik, this is the person I was trying to get on before. They're calling in now, so they're unmuting. Okay. Hello, Robert Taub. Yes. Thank you for taking on these difficult issues and, and being clear and really helping so many people. My oldest daughter is 19, and um, I noticed that 
all of her friends are now entering the workforce, and uh, they work in really sophisticated jobs. They're going to fewer are going to college, but they're holding jobs with big responsibilities. They're not like teachers or a secretary. They come and go. And the, the schools, on the other hand, in high school, are so much more demanding what they learn and the pressure and the anxiety put on just to survive to make it into high school, into seminary. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between what they're learning, preparing them to be functioning from women, and what they're thrown into at the age of 19 and 20 into these worlds of business and real estate and nursing homes and speech therapists. And, and, and it, it's, everything seems to be that to succeed, what they're learning is not translating in the real world. I sometimes ask my daughter, like, you know the parasha this week? I'm going to laugh about it. She has no clue. Like, parasha, Rosh Chodesh. And I, and I feel there's a huge gap as we get from her and more to the right and whatever you want to call it, and then what they also have to do to be these sophisticated women providers, whether they're yeshivish, the modern orthodox, even the Hasidish world, of what's expected for a woman to be a provider and a mother and put together and pretty. Are we doing it correctly, and what can we do to help the girls trans- uh, transition and, and not just survive, but to really thrive and to feel connected? Yeah. I mean, this... Thank you for asking that. This really touches upon what I was just talking about, about women's education. It, it's not fair to use women as a labor force. If a woman wants a career, far be it from me, I'm not judging. But to engineer a system which creates a labor force of women who are not Jewishly educated to the level that they're capable of being educated. It's such a short sighted. It's, 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 it's such a short sighted gain. If, if there's any gain at all. And in the long term, who's raising the next generation, you know, the Jewish people, we have survived all types of material threats, whether it was uh, a lack of protection under the law or it was uh, actual active persecution or it was just simple poverty. And we're still here. We're still kicking. So we know how to deal with a lack of Gashmias. But I don't know if it's viable to engineer a lack of Ruchnias and to say that, well, it's just the women, so it won't come back to bite us. It's already coming back to bite us. The level of ruchnius in a home is established by the akeres abayis, by the woman. And you see this. You have men who are sitting and learning all day, and the women are understimulated in their Yiddishkeit. It's not a formula for success. So some of us are going to have to make some difficult choices It's going to have to be a spirit of Mesidus Nefesh here. Prioritize the ruchnias of women. And there's going to have to be a cultural change. If you can make one change in the girls' high school education, even seminary, to facilitate this, what what would you recommend that could be done that a girl at 19 going to the workforce or 20 could have a skill that that she has that's ingrained, that's part of of who she is that she could take with her? A skill? You mean a marketable skill? No, 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 no. A ruchniistic thing. A what could, what could a high school? Skill. Okay, good. What could the high schools do different? And to seminaries, okay. what could the education system right. do? We can't change everything, but what would be one thing you would do? Um, I'm going to get pushback for this, and they're going to accuse me of having a Chabad agenda. But I would say learning chassidus, and I'll explain why. Um, because Limita Torah is a mitzvah for a man. If a man sits and he learns Gemara, he learns uh, Nazir, and there's no practical application, he's doing a mitzvah, and he's connected to Chachmas Ritzayin Yishel HaKadosh Baruch A woman doesn't have such a chiv, but she does have a chiv to believe in Hashem and to love Hashem and to fear Hashem. And how can she do that properly, especially if she's deep and sophisticated, if she doesn't have an education that teaches her who is Hashem. 
So I would definitely say that uh, teaching chassidus, whether it's a basic sefer like Tanya, which is definitely at my bias. I'm very passionate about Tanya, and I've taught Tanya to thousands of women, and I've taught also to thousands of men, but I've probably taught to more women, Tanya, than to uh, to men. And again, soulwords.org or YouTube or TikTok or uh, Instagram or uh, wherever or, or Spotify or Google Podcasts, wherever you receive your content, but you'll go and you'll listen to classes that I'm giving serious text-based text-based. Okay. None of this. Why are women's classes always somebody comes in and cracks a bunch of jokes and then they tell some schmaltzy story and that's called a sheer. Okay. Text-based study, real learning, so that the woman can can have a, a, a deeply supported relationship with Hashem that is strong enough for her to transmit to the next generation. Thank you very much, Rabbi Tal. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, Shkari Rabbi Tal, first of all, for coming on again, and giving this was tonight's show was so powerful. I really loved it. It was uh, we really ripped mm. apart very deeply. There's a lot more to talk about, and. Uh, I don't know. We did the men, we did the woman. Now we have to do men, women and men, children. I don't know. We got to we got to cover everything. <laughs> Whenever you invite me, I'm here. This is my one well, of my I have to to be hang ask him is God the truth. God the truth. God the, you always not Nishma. You always say yes, and then we say, okay, what we talk about? <laughs> That's right. That's how it always happens. You're like, do you want to come on? And I'm like, yeah. And then it's like, uh, what are we talking? About? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Okay, if anybody wants to join the WhatsApp chats, please WhatsApp 732-314-1710. And then they'll send you the, the link for the community chats. All the all the information gets posted on the community chats. So you go to menachemburnfeld.com, sign up to the website. Every mail he sent, every week he sends out the emails, the replays, and all the important information of Coach Menachem. Again, if anybody's here the first time, every Sunday at 930 on the Zoom ID, we have different important topics. Please help spread the word. And next week, next week, February 18th, we're going to have a deep discussion with Rabbi Hanina Greenwald, Rosh Hashiva from TJ and Eretz Yisrael. Been a clinic for many, many years. He has, I think, thousands of Talmidim. And the title is going to be Is it possible to achieve proper parenting alongside unconditional love and freedom? Navigating parenthood, achieving harmony between guidance and freedom of adult teenagers. It's that balance. We live in a world that we have to unconditional love and be there and let everything go. At the same time, you have to be a parent and how to really deal with that guidance as more of the adult children, not, you know, as he doesn't want to talk with little about little children more as a little bit as they get older. It's very powerful. Please join us. Make sure everything is recorded on coachmanachem.com. If anybody has any questions, you can email coachmanachem at gmail.com. If anybody wants to get a hold of Rabbi Tal, but got a lot of text over the night, go to his website, soulwords.org, and all the information is there, and they can contact them there. And uh Shem, tonight's share is 175. If you want to listen to it on the phone lines, Menachem set up his own personal phone number, 732-305-9011. Again, the new number is 732 732- 305-9011. If you press pound, you listen to the most recent share, or you can text, put in the number of all the past shiurim, and you can listen to that share. And uh, again, thank you for all the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Ellie and Ariel for Five Town Central, Kyla Kaufman, and for Mrs. Mika Sofa from COL. I'm going to go to the closing first, the Menachem, and then we'll leave the after two and a half hours, Rabbi Taub to leave us with a powerful closing. Um, Menachem, Rabbi Taub, tonight was very powerful. I'm very happy we did this share. We've discussed it a while ago when we did the, the men's share. And I think there's a lot of important topics we really covered and a lot of clarity. And as much as we really uh, named this year, you know, what a woman is, it really tonight's year, I think, was, I would say, just as much for men as for women. That's my opinion. I think if husbands and wife would listen to the share together or men would listen to the share, they would gain just as much, if not more. Um, so even though it was marketed for women and maybe it validated a lot of points and also helped them with some clarity, I think a lot of it has to do with the starting point, it's my opinion. And um, I think tonight she was more of just general understanding of communication and how a marriage technical technicalities are supposed to work via the Torah. Um, I thought it was very, very, very deep. And um, and it was amazing. Thank you, Rabbi Tav, again. It's always amazing when you come on. Coach Menachem. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, he wrapped it up. Yeah, listen, it was very, very deep. And I, I want to add that... It probably opened a little bit of a can of worms for some people, um, realizing that they're in a situation that they might need to figure out, like the balance that we discussed. And uh, it's not easy. 
like you know, a lot of people sending messages, you know, they're good ideas, but how do we start the balance, you know, to whatever needs to be done? And uh, I would recommend find somebody to guide you, to sit with you, to at least help you start the process. And like we heard, for you know, if it's hard for a, a woman to accept, to uh, receive, uh, it could be there's a lot of uh, emotional neglect or whatever neglect there is. And that's something that it takes time, number one, to be aware of. And then to go and get the help. That's a process. It takes time. Not always easy. So... Um, Baruch Hashem, we're, we're here, we can talk about it, we can put it on the table, and now we have to take the steps to, to heal, which many need. Now, I see a lot of people sending questions. Um, send your questions, whether to me, to, to Rabbi Tao, and the Mitzvah Shem will get to um, answer them in Mitzvah Shem. So, Shkoyah Rabbi Tao for being here, and Hashem should help us all. Thank you very much. Rabbi Tao, leave us with some different chizik. Wrap it up. Wrap up two and a half hours. Okay, so we were speaking to women, but we are all women. What? We are all, well, let me explain something to you. Hashem got married at Matan Torah, and who was his wife? The Jewish people. So we collectively, the Jewish people, are Hashem's bride. And as we explained, what does a wife do for a husband? She receives from him, and then she takes what he gives her, and she gives it back to him in an upgraded fashion. So Hashem gave us this world he put us here in the world. He gave us the Torah to know how to live in this world. And it's our job to take this world and make it a perfect world by bringing Mashiach. And then it's going to be the ultimate celebration. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. And we'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Or Khanina Greenwald, thank you for joining us tonight. And by the way, the Kansas City Chiefs did win the Super Bowl, if anybody didn't want to know. But really, on a positive note, it was really, I was, I was very middle of the year. The, the IDF went in and they, they got the captives. It was unbelievable. It gave me such a chizik. It's unbelievable. Baruch Hashem. You continue to hear good news. Only mm -hmm. good news. Okay. Yeah. Everybody have a great night. Thank you.